Okay, so at the end of yesterday's reading, they jump 50 years into the future. Beowulf is king of the Geats. Hegelach has long been dead. And now a dragon is threatening the kingdom. Um, so he had handled and removed a... Okay. Uh, it began... Let's start here. The wide kingdom reverted to Beowulf. He ruled it well for 50 winters, grew old and wise as warden of the land until one began to dominate the dark, a dragon on the prowl, from the steep vaults of a stone-roofed barrow, where he guarded a horde. There was a hidden passage unknown to men, but someone managed to enter by it and interfere with the heathen trove. He had handled and removed a gem-studded goblet. It gained him nothing, though with the thief's wiles he had outwitted the sleeping dragon that drove him into rage, as the people of that country would soon discover. The intruder who broached the dragon's treasure and moved him to wrath had never meant to. It was desperation on the part of a slave, fleeing the heavy hand of some master, guilt-ridden and on the run going to ground, but he soon began to shake with terror. In shock, the wretch panicked and ran away with the precious metalwork. There were many other heirlooms heaped inside the earth house, because long ago, with deliberate care, somebody, now forgotten, had buried the riches of a high-born race in this ancient cache or cachet. Death had come and taken them all in times gone by, and the only one left to tell their tale, the last of their line could look forward to nothing but the same fate for himself. He foresaw that his joy and the treasure would be brief. A newly constructed barrow stood waiting on a wide headland close to the waves. Its entryway secured into it the keeper of the hoard had carried all the goods and golden ware worth preserving. His words were few. All right, so the gold that the dragon is guarding is from an ancient race. And when there was only one survivor left, he took all their treasure and put it in a, basically a cave. And these are his last words. Now, earth, hold what earls once held and heroes can no more. It was mined from you first by honorable men. My own people have been ruined in war. One by one they went down to death, looked their last on sweet life in the hall. I am left with nobody to bear a sword or burnish plated goblets. Put a sheen on the cup. The companies have departed. The hard helmet, hasped with gold, will be stripped of its hoops. And the helmet shiner who would polish the metal of the war mask sleeps. The coat of mail that came through all fights, through shield collapse and cut of sword, decays with the warrior. Now may webbed mail range far and wide on a warlord's back, beside his mustered troops. No trembling harp, no tuned timber, no tumbling hawk swerving through the hall, no swift horse pawing the courtyard, pillage and slaughter have emptied the earth of entire peoples. And so he mourned as he moved about the world, deserted and alone, lamenting his unhappiness day and night until death's flood brimmed up in his heart. Then an old harrower of the dark happened to find the horde open. That's the dragon. The burning one who hunts out barrows, the slick-skinned dragon threatening the night sky with streamers of fire. People on the farms are in dread of him. He is driven to hunt out hordes underground, to guard heathen gold through age-long vigils, though to little avail. For three centuries this scourge of the people had stood guard on that stoutly protected underground treasury, until the intruder unleashed its fury. He hurried to his lord with the gold-plated cup and made his plea to be reinstated. Then the vault was rifled, the ring hoard robbed, and the wretched man had his request granted. His master gazed on that find from the past for the first time. Okay, so the slave was just looking for 
some treasure to appease his master. But in doing so, he, he upset a dragon. The dragon has been sleeping for how many years? Hundreds of years. Three centuries, 300 years, the dragon slept undisturbed. And then some guy just happened to find it and stole something. All right. Um, if that sounds similar to what happened in The Hobbit, it is. Tolkien gained inspiration from this part, and he used The Hobbit to find the gold and upset the dragon. When the dragon awoke, trouble flared again. He rippled down the rock, writhing with anger, when he saw the footprints of the prowler who had stolen too close to his dreaming head. So may a man not marked by fate easily escape exile and woe by the grace of God. The horde guardian scorched the ground as he scoured and hunted for the trespasser who had troubled his sleep. Hot and savage, he kept circling and circling the outside of the mound. No man appeared in that desert waste, but he worked himself up by imagining battle. Then back in he'd go, in search of the cup, only to discover signs that someone had stumbled upon the golden treasures. The guardian of the mound, the horde watcher, waited for the gloaming with fierce impatience. His pent-up fury at the loss of the vessel made him long to hit back and lash out in flames. Then, to his delight, the day waned and he could wait no longer. Behind the wall, but hurtled forth in fiery blaze, the first to suffer were the people on the land, but before long it was the treasure giver who would come to grief. The dragon began to belt out flames and burn bright homesteads. There was a hot glow that scared everyone, for the vile skywinger would leave nothing alive in his wake. Everywhere the havoc he wrought was in evidence. Far and near, the Geet nation bore the brunt of his brutal assaults and virulent hate. Then back to the horde, he would dart before daybreak to hide in his den. He had swinged, swinged the land, swathed it in flame, in fire and burning, and now he felt secure in the vaults of his burrow, but his trust was unavailing. Then Beowulf was given the bad news, a hard truth, his own home, the best of buildings had been burnt to a cinder. The throne room of the Geats, it threw the hero into deep anguish and darkened his mood. The wise man thought he must have thwarted ancient ordinance of the eternal Lord, broken his commandment. His mind was in turmoil, unaccustomed anxiety and gloom, confused his brain. The fire dragon had raised the coastal region and reduced forts and earthworks to dust and ashes. So the war king planned and plotted his revenge. The warrior's protector, prince of the hall troop, ordered a marvelous all-iron shield with his smithy works. He well knew that linden boards would, be, would let him down and timber burn. After many trials, he was destined to face the end of his days. In this mortal world, as was the dragon, for all his leasehold on the treasure. Okay, so Beowulf does something that a lot of people do when bad things happen. They, they think about, wow, what did I do? Why is God punishing me? And so he thinks about this. He's like, I mean, I must have done something wrong because now my kingdom is being destroyed by a dragon. So uh, there's going to be more of that coming later. Uh, so he's smart enough knowing that, well, fire burns wood, so I don't need a wooden shield. I'm going to need an iron shield. So he has an iron shield made for him just for this purpose and he knows that he's coming to the end of his days he is in his 70s like he was a young man when he fought Grendel he's been king for 50 years so he is in his 70s or 80s and he's getting ready to fight a dragon he doesn't expect to win but he doesn't expect the dragon to live either could you imagine being 70 years old, trying to fight a dragon? That would be a short fight. Yet the Prince of the Rings was too proud. 
to line up with a large army against the sky plague. He had scant regard for the dragon as a threat, no dread at all of its courage or strength. For he had kept going often in the past, through perils and ordeals of every sort, after he had purged Hrothgar's hall, triumphed in Herat, and beaten Grendel, he outgrappled the monster of his evil kin. One of the cruelest hand-to-hand -hand encounters had happened when Higelac, king of the Geats, was killed in Friesland. Okay, they skipped this part earlier, but now they're going to go back and explain what happened to Higelac, the king of Beowulf, earlier in the story. Uh, the, the people's friend and lord, Hrethel's son, slaked a sword blade's thirst for blood, but Beowulf's prodigious gifts as a swimmer guaranteed his safety. He arrived at the shore, shouldering thirty battle dresses, the booty he had won. There was little for the hetwear to be happy about as they shielded their faces and fighting on the ground began in earnest. With Beowulf against them, few could hope to return home. So, Higelac was killed in Friesland. Beowulf was there, but escaped with his life. He had to swim from Friesland back to Sweden, or Geatland, and he swam with 30 suits of chainmail armor, which... It's probably hard to do, but not for somebody like Beowulf. This is a long time ago. This is not 50 years after he became king. This is like before he became king. Across the wide sea, desolate and alone, the son of Ecthéo swam back to his people. There Higgad offered him throne and authority as lord of the ring horde. With Higelac dead, she had no belief in her son's ability to defend their homeland against foreign invaders. Yet there was no way the weakened nation could uh, get Beowulf to give in and agree to be elevated over Heardred as his lord or to undertake the office of kingship. But he did provide support for the prince, honored and minded him until he matured as the ruler of Geatland. Okay, this is important. Um, after Higelac was killed, his own widow, Higgin, said... You know, now that Higlac's dead, my son would be next in line to be king, but I think he's too young. So I think Beowulf should be king. But Beowulf declined. He was like, no, no, no. Um, Heardred is old enough. He'll grow into the part. Let Heardred be the king. All right. So against Higgins' wishes, her young son becomes king and ruler of the Geatland. Let's see if this ends up being a mistake. Then, over sea roads, exiles arrived, sons of Othair. They had rebelled against the best of all the sea kings in Sweden, the one who held sway in the Schilfling nation, their renowned prince, Lord of the Mead Hall. That marked the end for Higelac's son. His hospitality was mortally rewarded with wounds from a sword. Heardred lay slaughtered, and Onella returned to the land of Sweden, leaving Beowulf to ascend the throne, to sit in majesty and rule over the Geats. He was a good king. Now remember it said um, earlier that Beowulf is trying to figure out why is the dragon attacking? Why is God punishing me? Well, the only thing he can probably point to was this mistake that he made. When he was offered to be king of the Geats, he turned it down. Instead, the king became uh, Heardred, who was too young and not experienced enough. And because of his inexperience and his lack of wisdom, he ends up dead. Some exiles showed up in Geatland. They were running away from the Swedes, who were another powerful tribe living north of them. Well, Heardred accepts them and gives them shelter. But when the she when the so when the Swedes show up, Heardred then has to like fight them, all because of these exiles. But the Swedes win and Heardred gets killed. So even though Beowulf didn't want to be king, he ends up having to be king because Heardred 
didn't do a good job and lost against the uh, the Swedes. Now, you also might remember earlier in the story, Hrothgar helped in exile. Remember, Beowulf's father, Ecthéo, was running away from the Wolfings, but then Hrothgar paid the Wolfings off and settled and made peace. Now, Beowulf would have known this, so if Beowulf was king when the exiles came running away from the Swedes, when the Swedes show up, Beowulf probably would have paid the Swedes off a lot of money and there would have been peace because he knew about, you know, how to handle that kind of thing. Whereas Heardred was too young and didn't know how to handle, you know, bribes and payoffs and stuff like that. So Heardred pays the price. Now, is it Beowulf's fault that Heardred just happened to be king and made the wrong decision? I bet he feels a little bit guilty, wouldn't you? So maybe that's the sin that the dragon is making the Geats pay for right now and making Beowulf pay for. All right. In days to come, he, that's Beowulf, contrived to avenge the fall of his prince. He befriended Eadgils when Eadgils was friendless aiding his cause with weapons and warriors over the wide sea, sending him men. The feud was settled on a comfortless campaign when he killed Onella. Okay, so Beowulf paid Eadgil and gave him weapons, and Eadgil de uh, declared war on Onella and killed Onella. Remember, Onella is the name of the king that married Rothgar's sister. This interesting little side note there. And so the son of Ecthéo had survived every extreme, excelling himself in daring and in danger until the day arrived when he had to come face to face with the dragon. The Lord of the Geats took eleven comrades and went in a rage to Reconnoitur. And again, eleven plus Beowulf, that makes twelve. So who's the thirteenth? Oh, I know who the thirteenth is. Remember, I said 13 is a sacred number in Viking? Well, we'll get there. By then he had discovered the cause of the affliction, being visited on the people. The precious cup had come to him from the hand of the finder, the one who had started all this strife and was now added as the 13th to their number. They press-ganged and compelled his, this poor creature to be their guide. Okay, so Beowulf and 11 men is 12. And then they used the thief, the slave who woke the dragon and upset the dragon. He would be the 13th to go with them on their expedition. Against his will, he led them to the earth vault he alone knew, an underground barrow near the sea billows and heaving waves heaped inside with exquisite metalwork. The one who stood guard was dangerous and watchful, warden of that trove, buried under earth, no easy bargain would be made in that place by any man. The veteran king, that's Beowulf, sat down on the cliff top. He wished good luck to the Geats who had shared his hearth and his gold. He was sad at heart, unsettled yet ready, sensing his own death. His fate hovered near, unknowable but certain. It would soon claim his coffered soul, part life from limb. Before long, the prince's spirit would spin free from his body. Spoiler alert, Beowulf thinks he's going to die. All right, let me see. Should I keep reading? We're on page 61. You know what? I guess that's a good place to stop. No, one more page. No, I'm stopping. It's been 19 minutes. I'm going to stop there, and then we're going to pick up tomorrow.